Paramedic Pediatric Emergencies, Part 4. In this lecture, we're going to talk about pediatric airway management. We're going to quickly review basic and advanced airway management. So the first steps to airway management is going to be to do a good general assessment of the patient. You need to remember the anatomy of the pediatric patient and remember what could possibly be the issue. First thing you should do is check for obstruction. Position the airway using head tilt chin lift or the jaw thrust maneuver. And remember, airway adjuncts, even your basic airway adjuncts, may be helpful. Airway is always the first step in managing any respiratory emergency. The child younger than two years, place a thin layer of padding under the shoulders or upper torso to align the airway. Your airway adjuncts may be oral pharyngeal airway or nasal pharyngeal airway. Remember the basics of your airway adjuncts. Your OPA, it keeps the tongue from blocking the airway, which will make suctioning easier. And you would use this with patients who are unresponsive but do not have a gag reflex. You want to avoid injuring the hard palate as you insert and do your best to not cause any type of trauma to the airway. Your nasal pharyngeal airway is usually well tolerated. It's used for conscious patients and patients with altered levels of consciousness, but it is rarely used for children younger than one year. To provide oxygenation, you are going to have to figure out, do we need to use ventilatory equipment or oxygenation equipment or both? Assessing ventilatory and oxygenation status is part of your breathing assessment. All patients with respiratory emergencies should receive supplemental oxygen. And your two most common delivery methods for just oxygen devices for supplemental oxygen is going to be using the blow-by technique and your non-rebreather mask. Your blow-by technique is best used when only a small amount of supplemental oxygen is needed or when the patient cannot tolerate wearing the mask needed for higher oxygen delivery. It can be an oxygen tubing with a mask or a cup or a similar device. A child or caregiver can hold the device near the patient's face. However, you want to stay away from styrofoam cups because it may blow fluorocarbons into the child's airway. Your goal here is to increase oxygen concentration immediately around the mouth and nose. The non-rebreathing mask is preferred for patients who have lower oxygen saturations in significant respiratory distress or respiratory failure. Your non-rebreather mask can deliver up to 95% supplemental oxygen and you'll use high flow rates with your non-rebreather. This is 10 to 15 liters per minute. Your bag valve mask device is used to put, provide airway ventilation. If respiratory efforts not improve with airway positioning or an airway adjunct, then you would want to start assisting ventilation using a bag mask device. You may need to try a variety of mask sizes, but most important, you want to use the mask that appropriately fits the child so that you will be able to have a good seal. You will deliver breath rates at a rate of 12 to 20 breaths per minute for infants and children. One breath every two to three seconds and you want to squeeze the bag only until you see chest rise. Be very careful to not over distend the chest, especially in smaller children because you could cause barotrauma. Your supraglottic airways there's several devices that you can use, several supraglottic airways that are available for use in the pediatric patient. These devices are used to provide positive pressure ventilation to apneic patients, and they help you maintain a patent airway in unresponsive patients who are breathing spontaneously, but who not, do not require advanced airway management with endotracheal tube. Your endotracheal intubation. So this is actually passing a tube through the glottic opening and sealing the tube with a cuff inflated against the tracheal wall. This is going to be your most definitive airway, but this is also a skill that's very rarely used with pediatric patients. Your advantages of endotracheal intubation. It is a definitive airway, and it also decreases your risk of aspiration. 
However, you do have high complication rates, which include bradycardia because of a vagal response, increased intracranial pressure, or incorrect placement. Potential complications would include damage to the teeth and oral structures, aspiration while performing the act of intubation, bradycardia due to a vagal response, or bradycardia due to hypoxemia from prolonged attempts. Also run a risk of increased intracranial pressure and most detrimental would be incorrect placement, whether it is incorrect placement into the right main stem bronchus, which may result in hypoxia and adequate ventilation, or a potentially catastrophic complication, which is unrecognized misplacement of the tube in the esophagus, which would cause gastric inflation. Your indications for endotracheal intubation would be cardiopulmonary arrest, traumatic brain injury, inability to maintain a patent airway, and need for prolonged ventilation. When you are intubating a pediatric patient, you've got to remember the anatomical differences between the adult and pediatric airways. When you do intubate a pediatric patient, you must use pediatric equipment. Laryngoscope blades sizes 0 to 3 with small children using Miller blades or straight blades. You can use any size laryngoscope handle. Your appropriately sized blade extends from the patient's mouth to the tragus of the ear. You should use a length-based resuscitation tape as a guide to help you decide what size tube you should use. For premature newborn concerning blade size, you should use a size zero straight blade. For full-term term newborn to one year, a size one straight blade. Two years to adolescence, a size two straight blade. Again, we're using the straight blade because we want to displace the floppy epiglottis over the glottic opening. The use of an uncuffed ET tube is no longer recommended by the American Heart Association. The cuffed ET tube use a 3 millimeter tube for infants and a 3.5 millimeter tube for children between 1 and 2 years of age. And the following formula can be used for children older than 2 years. 4 plus the aging years divided by 4 equals your cuffed tube size. Always have a tube that is one size smaller and one that is one size larger than expected available for situations in which there is a variability in upper airway diameter. For patients who are younger than 8 to 10 years, you may choose to use uncuffed tubes, although this is no longer acceptable. The HA recommendation in 2020 is that it is reasonable to choose a cuffed endotracheal tube over an uncuffed ET tube for intubating infants and children. When a cuffed ET tube is used, attention should be paid to the ET size, position, and cuff inflation pressure, which is usually less than 20 to 25 centimeters water. Routine use of cricoid pressure is not recommended during endotracheal intubation of pediatric patients. The appropriate depth for endotracheal intubation in a pediatric patient is going to be two to three centimeters beyond the vocal cords. Be sure that you remember to record as the mark at the corner of the child's mouth and remember that you document this and you want to keep double checking where your placement is. To endotracheal intubate a pediatric patient, first you need to pre-oxygenate the patient. This does not mean hyperventilation, but pre-oxygenation with a bag mass device and 100% supplemental oxygen for at least two to three minutes before you attempt intubation using the squeeze, release, release technique. Adequate pre-oxygenation cannot be overemphasized. You wanna make sure that you have your SpO2 up during the period of time that you're going to be trying to intubate the patient. During the time of pre-oxygenation, ensure that the child's head is in the proper position which would be neutral position with suspected spinal trauma or sniffing position without trauma. Also have your suction available as well. If an intubated patient child deteriorates, use the DOPE mnemonic to identify the problem. DOPE D is displacement, O is obstruction, P is pneumothorax, and E is equipment failure. 
Complications of endotracheal intubation, again, could be unrecognized esophageal intubation, uh, induction of emesis, possible aspiration, hypoxia from prolonged intubation attempts, and damage to the teeth, soft tissues, and intraoral structures. You want to frequently monitor tube position, especially after any major patient move, and you want to use the gold standard of monitoring with the endotracheal intubation, and that's going to be continuous waveform capnography. In the case that you need to perform gastric decompression, this can be completed by the use of an NG tube placement or an OG or orgastric tube placement. This is going to be used to decompress the stomach. It removes the contents with suction and it makes assisting ventilation easier. However, this is contraindicated in unresponsive children. You want to have the appropriately sized NG or OG tube, a 30 to 60 milliliter syringe with a funnel tipped adapter, have mechanical suction available, adhesive tape for securement, and you should also use water soluble lubricant. To perform NG placement, you should select your appropriate tube size, measure the tube on the patient, which should be the same as the distance from the lips or tip of the nose to the earlobe, mark the length of the tube with tape. Place the patient in a supine position. If the patient is unresponsive, you should always perform ET intubation before gastric tube placement. In a trauma patient, maintain inline stabilization of the cervical spine and lubricate the end of the tube. For OG tube insertion, you want to insert the tube over the tongue, advance the tube into the hypopharynx, then rapidly into the stomach, and immediately remove the tube if you have any types of coughing, choking, or change in the voice, because that could indicate that you have tracheal placement. For NG tube insertion, you want to insert the tube gently through the nearest, direct straight back along the nasal floor. Never force the tube. Advance the tube into the stomach. And if you're unsuccessful with the NG tube, but you do need gastric decompression, you should use the OG approach. You should aspirate stomach contents. If you have stomach contents and if you hear a rush of air over the stomach, then placement is correct. If correct placement cannot be confirmed, you should remove the tube. Complications with gastric decompression tubes. Placement of the tube into the trachea, which will result in hypoxia. Vomiting, aspiration of stomach contents, airway bleeding or obstruction, or passage of the tube into the cranium, which could be a very bad thing for the patient. This concludes part four of pediatric emergencies. If you have any questions on pediatric airway, please contact me, Nick Ray at suscc.edu.